Hi guys and welcome to the Senses Lecture 3. This lecture is going to cover hearing and equilibrium. So let's get started. When you're talking about hearing, we're going to have to mention a little bit about sound and how sound waves travel. But I promise we're not going to get into the physics of sound waves in detail. Hearing, unlike smell and taste, is a mechanoreceptor. The basics of it are a sound wave travels down the ear canal and vibrates the tympanic membrane, the ossicles, and then ultimately some tiny little hairs in the cochlea of your ear, and it physically shakes those hairs. And as they bend and flex, that triggers nerves. And those nerves fire for sending an action potential to the brain, and the brain interprets what you're hearing. And it happens almost instantaneously. Uh, or for lack of a better word, it is instantaneously. So this is a mechanoreceptor. You're physically shaking hair cells to make this work. Unlike smell, where a chemical is binding to a receptor to ultimately turn the nerve on. You know, senses is all about ultimately turning on a nerve. Um, equilibrium works basically the same way. It is a mechanoreceptor as well. Your ear has three portions, the external, middle, and the internal portion. External is the oracle that you see in the ear canal. The middle ear contains the bones, the famous little bones, the malleus, incus, and stapes. And the inner ear contains the cochlea, which looks a little bit like a snail. And here's your main function down here. Collect and translate the vibrations in air. Ultimately, the brain is what's going to do the translation. A sound wave basically occurs when you vibrate something. And you see the picture up here, this little tuning fork. And you can picture it shaking back and forth. And as it moves, keeping in mind the air is made of a bunch of molecules as well, it's going to compress and spread apart molecules. So you're going to get waves of high pressure and waves of low pressure. And that is a sound wave. And we can actually measure that wave, and we'll talk about a few of these terms like amplitude. Um, and how they relate to hearing as well. But basically, as this tuning fork vibrates, the sound wave is going to travel out in all directions. And of course, if you take a physics class, you can get into a lot of math with this and talk about the Doppler effect and many things of that nature. Here you've got the get rid of that. Here you've got the basics of a sound wave and these alternating currents of high and low pressure. The properties of sound, frequency, wavelength, amplitude, are, are pretty common terms. Uh, the number of waves that pass by a given point is the frequency. So the higher the frequency, the more waves are going by a given point. The wavelength is just the distance between the two crests. So if you look back at that picture, uh, the distance from one crest to the next, it can be spread apart or it can be really close together. The amplitude is the height of those crests. Talk about it in relation to hearing here in just a second. Pitch is a perception of different frequencies. Now we, as humans, can hear between 20 and 20,000 hertz. Um, elephants can communicate, you know, way down here below the 20 range, and we cannot hear those. A zookeeper first figured this out from a feeling a vibration, kind of like in her hair when she was standing near elephants at the zoo and she couldn't hear the sound but she could feel the vibration and they started researching it and they started figuring out that elephants use these really low frequencies to communicate over very long distances and dogs of course can hear frequencies we can't hear so you, know, you can blow on the dog whistle you hear nothing but that really high pitch um, can make the dog go a little crazy loudness is once again, an interpretation. Loudness, just, just like smell or anything else, this is interpretation. It's not equally loud to everything. But normal range, 0 to 120 decibels. And you get above 100 and, you know, up there in the 100 range. And so it, it can get loud enough to hurt your eardrums or cause physical damage, temporary hearing loss. You, know, you don't want to stand around a jet engine very long, as loud as they get. Looking at this picture, this will break some of it down for you pretty easily. And you see high frequency, very short wavelengths, so from here to here is not a 
not a really long distance compared to the blue line. The low frequency from here to here is a much longer distance between the wavelengths. So this would be in red, a very high pitched sound. Uh, this would be you know, Whitney Houston hitting one of those high notes. This would be a very low pitched sound uh, as you perceive it in your brain. Amplitude will connect with loudness. So the higher up you go, the louder the sound is, the lower down it is, the softer it is. So amplitude relates to how loud or how soft things get, whereas frequency is more along the lines of pitch. And we have pretty discerning ears. And people who spend time in music can tell really minute differences between loudness and pitch and these things. All right, looking at the parts, we've already mentioned the external parts of the ear, the oracle, uh, the parts you can touch, the external auditory meatus, tympanic membrane. This is just basically called your eardrum for layman's terms. Inside our middle ear, we've got the tympanic cavity. And setting in that little cavity is our little auditory ossicles, the malleus, the incus, and the stapes, sometimes called the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup. Um, these are three very microscopic, tiny little bones. If you're looking at this picture, this would be like you were standing right here behind the ear and looking this direction. Uh, this would be the tympanic membrane. You can see the bones here. Uh, this is the pedius muscle as well as the tensor over here. Um, and basically as this eardrum shakes and vibrates so will these bones and ultimately the stapes here will vibrate something called the oval window which we'll be moving to next. Looking at getting further into the ear, the oval window is going to connect the outside of the cochlea. And this is where hearing is going to actually occur. So this is the job of the stapes to vibrate this. And when we get to a picture here in a minute, I'll show you the eustachian tube or auditory tube. This is often where you see kids have to have tubes put in their ears for inner ear infections. It basically drains the ear to the throat, which is sort of gross when you give it a little thought that you have a tube that's draining your ear to your throat. The inner ear consists of an osseous labyrinth and a membranous labyrinth. It's a bony canal and filled with perilymph inside. It's a type of fluid. The membranous labyrinth is filled with endolymph. The cochlea is where hearing is going to occur. This is the part that looks like a snail. And you got these little curly canals on top of the cochlea called semicircular canals, which function in balance, equilibrium. And so does the vestibule, functioning in equilibrium. I'll clear this up with a picture. So here would be our semicircular canals for equilibrium vestibule would be sitting right in here. Cochlea is here, and this is where those little hair cells are lining inside this thing that is going to bend and flex. So basically you're going to shake the tympanic membrane, shake these bones, shake this oval window, which is going to shake a fluid in here, and these hair cells are going to bend and flex you know, in, inside that fluid. And that's going to send a signal down the vestibulocochlear nerve, ultimately to the auditory of the brain for interpretation. This is your auditory tube, or your station tube, pharynx. That is your throat. So sometimes you have to put a tube in here to help prevent inner ear infections. Taking a blown up look here at, at the cochlea, and you can see if you were to like take a slice view, cut this semicircular canal in half, you would have the bony labyrinth, the perilymph, the membranous labyrinth, and then the endolymph, the types of fluid. And I'll probably just call these fluid on a test question. If you cut across a slice of the cochlea, you'll see these terms, the scala vestibuli, scala tympani, and they'll be filled with the perilymph. And hearing is actually going to occur in between those two. And I'll show you a more blown up picture here in just a second. The scala vestibuli, upper compartment, pani, lower compartment, uh, cochlear duct, part of the membranous labyrinth, vestibular membrane. It's going to separate that cochlear duct from the scala vestibuli. And the basilar membrane is going to separate that cochlear duct from the scala tympani. In wording, it, it a lot of times doesn't make sense. So I always like you know, using images, and we'll do that here in just a second to review that. I want to point out that where hearing actually occurs is a group of hair cells that's lining inside that cochlea. Um, these hair cells is 
collectively called the organ of corti. Uh, the upper surface of the basilar membranes where they're embedded, and they're also embedded in a tectoral membrane. Various frequencies, uh, very high pitch to low pitch, our whole range will vibrate these various hair cells. And different hair cells are sensitive to different frequencies. So we have a, a basically starting in the lower part of the cochlea, where you're going to find the ones that have the highest hertz, you know, sensitive to 20,000 hertz or so. And as you move around the little circle, it, it gets a little lower. So where you can sense things like that are 100 hertz or 200 hertz or something like that. This gives you a basic overview here. If you want to read over that. Here's a nice blown up picture. Now this is a cutaway view of the cochlea. And you see the scala vestibuli with the perilymph inside. Uh, there's the tectoral membrane where these hair cells are embedded in. The basilar membrane sitting right here which is going to separate the scala tympani from the cochlear duct. Uh, over here you'll also find your tectoral membrane which is well, I've already mentioned but it, you can't really see it. I'll show you another image here in just a second where these hair cells are in, embedded in this. So that's a good view just kind of picture it as a slice or cutaway view. Okay here's that blown up view I was talking about. The tectoral membrane right here and you have these little hair cells embedded in it. As this fluid of cochlea, the perilymph, flows because the stapes is shaking the oval window, which is shaking this fluid. As this fluid moves as a wave, it vibrates the tectoral membrane, which bends and flexes these little hairs. This would be organ of corti here. The bending of these hairs is what triggers the nerve, and the nerve will then send electrical signals, ultimately out the vestibulocochlear nerve to the brain for interpretation. Different hairs responding to different frequencies, and that's the basics of hearing. That's why we call it a mechanoreceptor. This is a nice blown up image, real life uh, electron microscope of the actual hair cells. You can see what they look like in real life, you know, poking out there. This is the very basics of hearing. I've broken it down to uh, a pretty simplified version. You follow it through, a sound wave is going to travel down the ear canal. Vibrate the tympanic membrane, which is going to then vibrate the bones, the malleus, the incus, and stapes. The stapes is going to vibrate the oval window, and it's going to ultimately vibrate that fluid inside the cochlea, inside the scala tympani and the scala vestibuli. That wave is going to vibrate back and forth and shake the tectoral membrane, or we can just say the tiny hairs of the organ of corti. This is going to start an action potential nerve impulse. It's going to travel down the vestibulocochlear nerve to the auditory cortex of your brain where you're going to interpret that as my voice or someone else's voice or music or whatever. This video, if you copy paste this link, is very, very useful. Um, searched around YouTube and found this one. It, it breaks down hearing very well and animates it, so that should be quite helpful if you want to go and watch that video. Equilibrium, I'm going to short change a little bit. Just understand it is basically the same thing as hearing in that it's a mechanoreceptor. There's static and there's dynamic. <coughs> Excuse me. Static is going to send information about the position of the head. But once again, you're, you're bending and flexing hairs. It's done a little differently the anatomy here of the maculae, the hair cells are actually embedded in the autolithic membrane. These autoliths are tiny little stones that float basically in a gel. And as you lean to the right or to the left, the gel moves and shifts and the stones roll over and bend some hairs. It's actually kind of cool to think about. If you take a look at it, you see this kind of picture like a jelly or almost like jello. As you lean over, this jelly shifts force of gravity pulls these little stones all over to one corner and they bend these little hair tufts. The bending of this hair triggers the nerve. Now this, this is in the vestibule here. And off it goes. And down the vestibulocochlear nerve to give you interpretation about your balance. Now you can thin this jelly out and these stones can roll easier. Um, 
alcohol famously does that and you can you know, get a little off balance if you drink too much so inner ear infections can throw your balance off so your balance and information sending to your brain is centered right in the vestibule and in these semicircular canals this is where the dynamics going to be so dynamic equilibrium in the semicircular canals working the same way in this case it's the endolymph that's flowing over these tufts this, this cupula and these hair cells are embedded in it and they'll bend and flex as the endolymph flows and gives you uh, the direction of body movement which can come in important these angular head movements if you're doing gymnastics for sure so that's the basics of hearing and the basics of equilibrium lecture four is going to cover the basics of sight i'll see you next time